What's up everybody, Chip here with Main Street Mower and I'm with my brother Stu. Hello. We are gonna be talking about what happens to your string trimmer when you remove your guard and let your line get a little longer than maybe you should. It's a conversation we have every day with our customers and it really shortens the life of your unit. A trimmer like this could have an average of a five year life on a commercial landscape crew. Take the guard off, you get one year. And we're gonna show you with, through some tests why that does mess your unit up over time, right? Take the guard off, you get one year because you're adding a ton of load to your motor and we're just not able to account for the physics that foot pounds of torque of adding more line out to your machine cause. So we hope to illustrate that to you with this little heat gun, this little tachometer, we're gonna get down to some numbers. So Steel spends a lot of time training technicians. One of the things they do at Gold Training School, so it's like a week program up in Virginia Beach, and they simulate all the potential failures. They show you all kinds of images of units that have failed all types of ways. And one of the tests they do is they run a trimmer in a stand like this, and they run the line out inch by inch, and they do a test just like we're gonna do today until the engine literally will just like melt down. We have never personally gone to gold school but we've sent our technicians and they've come back with the tales of morning coffee while they burn up a trimmer orange mocha frappuccino <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we want to see it for ourselves right and we couldn't find it anywhere on the internet so we made it for you and we're willing to waste this machine for the sake of the video for the sake of science and for the sake of your future trimmers and your businesses because really this is going to help you guys save money in the long run right having a little knowledge totally so we're going to do a baseline test i'm just going to take off this strap here because it's kind of in the way and when this is a brand new one out of the box never been ran we're just going to let it run until it gets up to temp and we're gonna check the RPMs and all that sort of stuff. And this is an OEM steel tachometer. It works by reading electrical pulses. So you attach it to your spark plug lead. So we're gonna have this thing rigged up onto this unit. This is an air-cooled engine. So the fan of this motor and the cover is important. It's directing the airflow around the cooling gills of this motor. So by having this cap off, it may affect the air travel right. a bit. But because we're going to leave the cover off for all the different line lengths, it'll still give us... We'll see. We can't really test the RPMs without this off, so we're going to give it a shot. We think this is still a fair test. I have a zip tie for the throttle. We're going to zip tie the throttle wide open. We're going to let it run for a minute here. We're going to try to be as safe as the internet world wants us to be. Uh, we don't want our sensitive little ears to get hooked. So we got these steel-approved earmuffs. I can't hear nothing. <laughs> So the first thing we had to do is bump the line so it reaches the line limiter. All right, the line limiter on this trimmer, when it advanced, hit this line and cut it to this length here. And this is what the engine is tuned for, is this amount of line. Five and three quarters inch. Test one, OEM line length heat test. It started raining while we were starting the test. It's windy out here. We took a baseline of three different temperatures. We're measuring the head temperature, so right below the valve cover, the muffler temperature, and the gear case temperature. All three of those temperatures are gonna vary, we believe, as we start to ramp up the string length. So now we're gonna remove the guard, and we're gonna extend the line from five and three quarter inches out to, what Six do you think? Six and three quarter. Just one inch, one bump. Okay, so we just bumped it. We moved it up to six and three quarters inches. I know most of you guys out there are running it much longer than this. Crazy. You're crazy, girl. Okay, so we're gonna crank it up. We're gonna let it rip again. So it should be seven and three quarters.
So we're gonna bump it again one more inch. We're at eight and three quarter inches of line um, on either side. I know you guys have done it. I've seen your line get this long. That's about how they come in normally. That is about average for a landscaper without a guard. They think they're being modest, but what's the overall length of that? They're 25 and 5 eighths. It's your overall width. That's pretty serious. It's a wee little motor. <laughs> 10 and 3 quarter inches, let's go. Twelve and three quarters inch, test eight. I don't think people are going much wider than that, you think? <laughs> Woo! Time for some results. We found some very interesting data. You can see it on your screen there now. You know, we started with the standard amount of line as if you had the guard on. Kind of a cool thing that we didn't really realize at the time is the bump head itself was four and a half inches. So if you add up the little bits of line sticking out in the four and a half, you get a diameter of 16 inches is the stock amount that steel's telling you to run. And we took it all the way up to 30 inches. So a lot of people joke, that's a 30 inch lawn mower when they see you with a guard off and that's where we took it. Something I didn't realize is that actually when you bump that bump head, I always thought it was one inch of line. It's actually one and one eighth inch. So we were shaving off one eighth of an inch as you saw in the video. Just for very clean numbers for future analysis and diameter and that sort of stuff, it would get a little confusing. And we were being highly accurate. Yes. Now we found that there are a ton of places to measure temperature on this engine. It's really hard to find an exact spot that is the exact same every time. And we were using this gauge, which we were uh, testing constantly on each other's foreheads and on the ground and just kind of questioning, is it accurate? But we do believe it was quite accurate. We at least were consistent, right? We found one particular spot on the top of the cylinder that was always the hottest, yep. and that is what we used. We also realized that we didn't really hit like max temp until we really soaked in yep. for at least 10 minutes of runtime. The first column of data is your RPM. With the standard amount of line, you have 9,400 RPM. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> hitting the rev limiter. And what Steele has always told us is that with every inch beyond that cutter, the line limiter, uh, you get a thousand RPM drop and, and you get an additional 50 degrees of temperature. In fuego. A thousand RPM drop per inch, busted. That yep. is not what we found. There's definitely a power band. There's like a times where it drops a little bit, a little bit, and then it drops huge amounts, and then it drops a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Exactly. So right. your horsepower is the greatest in your car at, cer at a certain RPM, and that's the case with this little engine as well. From test one to test two, we saw a 280 RPM drop. Barely anything. And then we saw a 520 RPM drop. Drop in the bucket. And then from test three to test four, which was going from 20 inches to 22 inches in diameter, we saw a 1,020 RPM drop. That was a big drop. That's a significant drop. And then we ended at 30 inches, we were all the way down to 5210 uh, RPM. Not quite half of the original, but 40% less than uh, the original yeah. RPMs, right? So that's a lot less revolutions. That's, that, that engine is bogging. She hurt. And there was a point in the test, we believe it was around the 24 inch diameter, Yeah. that the motor was struggling like it was gonna die on us. It, it even shut off a couple times. It was really not liking that. That was an interesting power band. It wasn't getting the right amount of fuel to air in some, some way, it did not like that. It was not happy. You know, we also tested on two different days and one of the days a crazy storm rolled in, that ambient temperature outside dropped probably 15 degrees. So there's a little effect there, but we did spend like probably three hours yeah. testing, uh, letting this run long enough to get us good temp. So the next thing would be head temp. So yeah. with the standard amount of line, 
uh, we found the motor running about 275, maybe a little lower than that. For good measure, that's what we're going to call it because, you know, the temperature was bumping around. And just to clarify, the original myth that Steele has always said was each inch is 1,000 RPMs in 50 degree increase. Yes. So we were expecting to see a major increase in temperature, engine temperature, every bump. But that wasn't necessarily the case either. Either As we kind of go through these temperatures in a second here, you're going to see that the average temperature bump was... The first one was the highest, but then the rest were all pretty small jumps, mm -hmm. 10 degrees. Yeah. So from test one to test two, where we add one inch beyond the allowed amount, we uh, went up 30 degrees in temperature. And then after that, we went up eight degrees to 313. And then test four went to 321 and then 340. And then for the next four tests, we really saw the temperature level out. About 340, we would see it bump up into, we saw 343, but it just seemed like that was the max temperature. And we have some theories on why that is. We do think that the load was not allowing it to burn its fuel charge off completely. And possibly that unburnt fuel has cooling effect. So even though it's under some load pressures that yep. are heating it up, there's also a cooling effect going on as well. You, as your RPMs do drop, your fan speed slows down. So you would suspect that the explosion temperature is X, right? And your fan speed has slowed down. So you might, you still have hot explosions, but less fans. So you would think it would continue to climb, mm -hmm. but gas only burns so hot, right? Yeah. And aluminum cools so well. So at a certain point there, they balance out and they reach some kind of equilibrium, like where mm -hmm. the exploding gas is maybe say 700 degrees or whatever it is. It doesn't really matter if it has a strong fan blowing or small amount of fan blowing and the RPMs drop so it has less explosions happening so definitely some science there that we don't fully understand <laughs> I mean just like in your vehicle you see your temperature climb to 200 and get pinged there and if it's 30 degrees outside 200 and yeah. if it's 100 degrees 200 how does I don't we don't know <laughs> there's definitely some more scientific people out there that may may have the answer to that a little bit than we do. Yeah, but basically after we had nine and three quarters inches on either side, it pretty much plateaued at three, 340, 342 for the rest of the temperatures, mm -hmm. which that's interesting. Then the next thing would be muffler temperatures. Mm -hmm. So we definitely watched the muffler climb in temperature Yeah. up until we got to 24 inches. And then the muffler started going down. Yeah. There's less exhaust pumping through that muffler. And we also noticed as soon as we would turn the machine off, that thing would cool super fast. I mean, with the heat gun, we would just watch the temperature just falling out of the sky. It would go from 550 to 250 almost instantly. So maybe when you have half as many detonations pumping through that muffler, yeah. uh, you don't have as much heat. Yeah. Let me just clarify. <clears throat> These results are interesting, and by no means are we suggesting any particular thing. I expected very different things, right? Like, mm -hmm. I expected this temperature on the muffler to be absolutely screaming. I expected the head temperature to be in the 500s. Like, that's mm -hmm. going off the myth. I was like, oh, baby, we're going to melt this we're thing gonna down. We're going to see 800 here, and we're going to watch the metal melt. She's going to be just glowing. Yeah. glowing. yeah, I just, it wasn't like that. It was just <laughs> like, huh. I would it. rather have my $400 trimmer cruising at 275 degrees than 340. Definitely in the 340 range, we could smell plastic. Yeah, yeah. It, did, it, it felt hot. The rewind was even hot. Mm -hmm. Some of those components, even just to put your arm on next to, mm -hmm. it was less comfortable. The next column here is gearbox Tim. And I don't know if this is just a throwaway thing. We don't really have a good working theory of why we watched the temperature roll around. No. It, it could have been that uh, the grease in there liquefied and that had a cooling effect. Or it could be that at high speeds, it, there's more friction in there, and, and so um, at the lower RPMs, that gearbox is turning slower, and it doesn't matter that the line is causing the engine to work harder, the gearbox is not working harder, but we did see it go down kind of in the middle range, and then we saw it climb back up. Uh, that really makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it was just windier, and that <laughs> aluminum just stayed cooler. I mean, it could just been the cooling gills of the motor kind of regulated the temperature, but ambient temperature played a big part yeah. in the gearbox itself. And in this whole, all these tests, there were two <laughs> factors that are very different from when you guys are using them, is we were in the shade, and it happened to be 
pretty nice both days, mm -hmm. which is rare in Central Florida in the summer, but it was just having to be rainy, nice, breezy days. The other thing is we had string on it, but we weren't working with these items. Mm -hmm. These numbers are the best case scenario, the least amount of load with that string and with OEM string. So And a brand new motor with perfectly clean cooling system. Mm -hmm. And as this thing age and they fill up with debris, they're not gonna cool as well. I would imagine you're gonna see temperatures higher than this. Yeah, and if you take that 0.95 line out and you put <coughs> some- 105, 130, 155, Woo! something crazy. Yeah, or, or a blade on there. It's gonna be working a lot harder. Yeah, and that's just an interesting point. Especially if you're using that long line in grass, in brush, just out of curiosity, I had one of these cones and I kind of was touching the line with the cone and watching the RPMs, and that really took the RPMs down, mm. like significantly to another level. And the more line you have, the more resistance, the more it's gonna be grabbing, right? Yeah. Mm. So the final column is line tip speed. So what we did is we took the circumference of the circle, that 16 inch diameter we create, multiplied by the RPM, got how many revolutions are going on per minute. I'll spare you the math. We figured out the mile per hour accurately, and that is the speed of the tip of the line as it's exploding through blades of grass. It's pretty cool. And you figured uh, that out. It didn't change all that dramatically, but there definitely are points, and they kind of identify maybe the optimal power band, because this number would be pretty much exactly the same, because the RPM would fall as the line's having to travel further. Hmm. Um, so. 511, 496 are like the highest speeds that you see, and that's probably where the timing of the motor gives it the most horsepower, but we're not condoning. We're not suggesting that. And there is a, that's the largest RPM drop was between seven three quarters, eight and three quarters. Mm -hmm. So it's, if I had to choose between those, I would go with the higher RPM option yeah. rather than the lower, which is shorter. That's the seven three quarter inch. What about, what do you see in the shop from trimmer line, trimmers that come in with no guard on them? Yeah, we've been talking about that this week, just, and we talk about it all the time because we see it a lot. And um, I have some examples here for you guys, but one thing that we see is carbon buildup on the exhaust valves, right? And I can't really explain 100% exactly why, because we were kind of talking about that today, and like, why is it that it builds up considering the fuel that is entering that engine is proportional to your RPMs? It's being controlled by your impulse line, and, and it should, like, if you are running at a lower RPM, it should be introducing less fuel, and it should be able to consume as much as it's operating. But there's something that happens, I think, with work being done. Like, when there's an actual load, say grass, resistance, what have you, I think there's an unburnt element, like we talked about, that's causing some carbon buildup. So the valve train will need additional labor or, like, service work, right? Like, your valves will go out of timing faster. They'll have more carbon buildup. You'll, like, notice at a certain point where it'll just be really boggy or have like very little to no power and we need to get in there and decarbon those valves and readjust them, get you reset. That's and, one thing. And in the case of a four mix engine, we're talking about valves, but in a two cycle engine, that exhaust port hole, clogged. Yeah. Yeah, the muffler, yeah. loaded. Yeah. So it's not like you're escaping carbon buildup in either case. Yeah. Like I said, I don't really 100% understand exactly <laughs> why it's happening. I know there's just optimal heat ranges and RPM ranges that the engine does a better job of burning fuel at. Burning the load off more completely. Yes, and I think when you extend that line, you get out of that sweet spot and mm -hmm. it just doesn't have a full burn. Even though going off of the data, I'm not still 100% sure why. But that does definitely happen. We see it all the time and it's usually on trimmers without guards on them. And like I said, we're not saying here saying you gotta keep your guard on, even though steel would wanna say that. And we, you should, it's safer, right? But keep, keep your guard on, wear chaps, wear a full winter jacket, double goggles, wear a full glass shield. Main Street Mower endorses safety equipment <laughs> all the way. If you're not using it, these are some things you can learn. <laughs> but we're just coming from it from a practical, like, what does it do to your engine, right? Like, we have these conversations every day, and we have to build people, because, like, I can't warranty that valve cleaning, right? I can't, I can't warranty that valve adjustment. And you're gonna do it more often if you run it without the guard on it. And that's okay, like, I don't mind doing it. And we understand why you do it. I think it does help with a lot of things. It helps you see better, more efficient, all those things. But the reason for this video is to just talk about what actually is happening and why do 
dealers not recommend it and why does steel like strongly not recommend it mm -hmm. and just so that we all have a clear understanding it is causing some problems that is going to shorten the life of your trimmer is that right and it's not warranty <laughs> and it's not warranty and so that's one thing is valve adjustments are going to happen more regularly <coughs> you're not going to burn that gas off as well i have a couple examples of a worn out clutch assembly and i want to show you guys first an original and a lot of our customers do not account for this effect you have a clutch mounted to your motor and as you cross over 3500 rpm the shoes of that clutch open up and they grab this clutch drum and that is in, engaged to the drive shaft that powers your gearhead that's where your drive shaft goes in <coughs> it comes out these are where your your shoes we're going to be touching and making contact. This is where all the friction happens. All the, where the engine's power is being transferred into the shaft is happening right here at this little clutch. These little paws come out and touch the inside wall of this clutch drum. And when your gear head is at prescribed length, it's not putting a terrible amount of load on the shoe clutch drum exactly. contact points. Exactly. This is a brand new machine, and we've only ran it through these tests. And you can already see there's a lot of brake dust in here mm -hmm. just from running it at probably 30. Like, I don't think that would have happened. Like, look at my fingers. I don't think that would have happened with an original running it just wide open for three hours. No. I mean, it probably wouldn't have slipped at all. Yeah. And so what ends up happening is that when that line is longer, especially if you're doing work, that what is supposed to be fixed in place is slipping and it is creating heat and friction, and it's gonna wear this part out quickly. So it wears the shoes of the clutch, mm -hmm. and it wears the walls of the drum, and then the shoes have to expand further to make contact, and it spreads that spring to its breaking point. And then the spring breaks. You can <coughs> see this is a worn out clutch. You can see it's gotten so thin that it's actually chipped away. The spring snaps. I don't know if you can see with my hands in the way. The spring snaps, then the pulse fling open automatically, that's when you're cranking it and your head's spinning when you're trying to crank it. And it shouldn't do that. When you crank it, your head should not spin until you squeeze the trigger. It has to reach a certain RPMs for this, this clutch to deploy inside of your clutch drum and then you should spin your head. But when that spring breaks, it's gonna spin all the time. It's really hard to start. You're gonna break your rewind, break your rewind pulse, break your rope. It's just bad on your shoulder and you're gonna need to get a new spring at least, but usually while you're in there, you might as well put a new clutch in there. So what a lot of people do is they come in, they buy just the spring from us, and they put the new spring in there, and it breaks sure thing. <laughs> shortly after. And yeah. it's because the new spring is having to travel that greater distance, and it's beyond what it's specced out to stretch. Right. So to truly fix it, you have to replace this clutch and the drum. Yeah. There's an arrow on the clutch. It's directional. You see there's like a little like layer here. If you wear into your arrow tip here, you need a new clutch. Once you start to wear this pad down, you start to get into the tip of that arrow, your spring is gonna stretch too much and it's gonna snap your spring. So if you look at some of these other arrows on a used one, you could see the tip of this arrow has started to wear. It's really easy, it's only three screws to get to this point. If you start to notice your clutch is getting close to that tip, just go ahead and replace it. It's not a bad thing to do. You can also tell how much this is worn here. Look how thin this is compared to this. The original thickness is here on this edge. This seating up in here sliding, you know? And it wore all that away. So now that's how you get this paper thin clutch versus its original thickness, which was significantly thicker than that. Now this nose cone that holds your drum, it has a bearing in it. You used to be able to replace this bearing. Now it's made in. Yeah, and it's expensive. And if you expose it to a lot of heat and a lot of brake dust, it wears out more quickly. So you need this piece as well. Yep. Not only that, <coughs> but your drive shaft is a square shaft, right? It fits inside this hole. As you have longer line, there's gonna be more torque on this entire shaft situation. Mm -hmm. And we see the inside of this, it starts to round off inside here, basically, and then all of a sudden, your shaft will just be free spinning inside of your clutch drum. <laughs> and you won't have any resistance. And so your shaft ends up looking like this shaft. This is a real shaft from someone's trimmer, and you can see how rounded it is. And so you need to get a new shaft, a new clutch, new clutch drum, new nose cone bearing. And technically, it shouldn't be warranty because it wouldn't happen if you had the guard on. Do I wish they were just made sh strong enough to withstand that? I mean, sure. Where does it end, guys? If, you, if we made it strong enough for 30 inches, you guys would be ripping a 60-inch trimmer out there. <laughs> I think it's the only reason it's stopping at 30 is because it's 
it's too cumbersome or it's just blowing them up. So people are like, ah, that's far enough. You can't reach a, a balance between big enough motor, long enough line to give you any more than that, really. Yeah. I think I've, I've learned from this experience a lot. I think the things I'll, I'm going to take home is that it doesn't get as hot as I thought it did. Mm -hmm. I won't be telling people that lie anymore because I didn't really know that was a lie. Yeah. The cost of that clutch repair is mm -hmm. probably the most major concern, Yeah, I would say. Yeah. Keeping your valve train clean. Yeah. If you have a good process for that, there's a couple ways of doing that. Uh, we even have a video on that. Yeah. And if you have to get this whole <coughs> clutch repair, drive shaft, valve adjustment job, it's in like the 150 to 175 range, like really. And so yeah. that's getting up there. I mean, a new one of these machines costs what right now? 399. 399. So something to think about, right? Is it worth reinvesting half, almost half? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe the maybe it is that much more efficient. Mm -hmm. But just don't be mad at me when I charge you. <laughs> like, that's my point, right? It's like, I'm going to send this video to you and it's because I love you. <laughs> I just want you to know. We did the work. We just want you to understand what's going on. Some mixed results. We've learned <clears throat> a lot. It was a great experiment. If you want to see more experiments like this, please like and subscribe. We are a outdoor power equipment store here in Central Florida. Our name is Main Street Mower, and we want to meet you and become your mower shop and make great videos for you to help you become a more successful landscaper. Thanks for sticking with us and slogging through all these numbers <laughs> and all this minutia. Yeah. But it's fun to us, and hopefully we're becoming friends with people who uh, it's fun to them as well. Yeah. Hey, and if you kind of do understand why <clears throat> it's building up carbon, even though the that whole situation, if you can explain it better than we did, I would love to see it in the comments. Please comment below. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool, guys. Thank you. Take it easy.